Okay, so I'm not going to be the universal voice of God. I'm going to situate myself. So here is my story. Can we show my photo, please? I've worked so hard to dig it from yeah, my take it with your fingers and you can move it. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. That's me. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Maybe 10, 20 year old. I don't know, but I was really tiny. So, okay. <laughs> so, this is my journey of unlearning. Yeah. So, I do not stand here in front of you as a decolonial expert. I stand here before you as a journey, somebody who's making her journey. And still has a lot to unlearn, yeah? So my pedagogical approach is, so this term comes from Black Lives Matter movements that Cambridge has now duly ins inserted in its dictionary. So I picked it up from Cambridge Dictionary because we still have colonized mind that unless Cambridge University tells this is the right definition. You know, anyway, so this comes from anti-racist struggle. That it is to make an effort to forget your usual way of doing something so that you can learn a new and sometimes better way, and in fact, more just and fairer ways, better ways, right? So that's my journey. And how did it start this journey? Now, how do you go? Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> you slide like this. Like. Slide. slide. Ah, like that. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm not a spokesperson for Black Lives Matter. Yeah. I do not want to give myself that kind of arrogance. I'm an unlearner with them and from them. So, so what I'm gonna say, I was born into a relatively privileged background from a mixed caste background. And Kavya here knows what it means to be born in a caste, in a very deeply casteist society of South Asia. So it's a hierarchy. Brahmin supremacy at the top, and then you have trading communities, you have Kshatriyas and trading communities, warriors and trading communities, and then you have Shudras, which is lowly caste, and then you have outside the caste. So you have untouchables, Dalits, who were made to serve the Savarna caste, the, the, uh, what's called as upper caste, but we call it dominant caste from anti-caste struggle. So dominant caste, untouchable because their role is to sweep and clean, take the human excrement and all that. And Adivasis, these are all outside the caste. Their role is to serve the privileged. So I was born in mixed caste background. My father comes from the uh, oppressed caste background. My mom comes from a trading community and I had lots of access to Savarna caste capital. So caste capital, I had that. So I cannot deny that. My skin color in India is privileged. I'm not considered as darker skin color. Hmm? I'm considered as gori in India, which means whiter. Yeah. So my skin also gave me privileges. So I just want to reveal all this complexity because colonization is a contextual issue. It's not a universal recipe. Hmm? Uh, so I was born into a very privileged location, but I had my own challenges. My formal schooling was about preparing for the industry, right? So serving particular capitalist caste and class, making us productive human capital to serve the national GDP, you know, which doesn't serve everybody. But I didn't know that, right? But in my home, I was a victim of patriarchy in my surrounding because women were not supposed to be that. Women were supposed to play another script, which is cultural reproducer. And I was like, gosh, I don't want to marry. I don't want to have, you know, all that traditional script. I want to travel the world. And you know what? My dreams were Eurocentric. I was wearing shalwar kurta and I was dreaming of dressing up a jeans, and, uh, you know, like these kind of clothes that reflected modernity and progress and civilization. And I felt I was backward because the discourses told me that what I wear is backward. The language I speak is backward. I need to speak English. I, and so my dreams were Eurocentric. My aspirations were that. And I dreamt of studying in Oxford when I was, you know, that tiny. And my father and the discourse around me was, no, no, no. 
And I'm like, yes, yes, yes. So you see that Eurocentrism is, I'm struggling there, but also I'm challenging the patriarchal script for me, right? I want freedom as a woman. Anyway. Sorry yes. for that interruption. Could you move a little bit because so, oh, that, we sorry, yes, on, so yes. that we can read the Yes, at yes. the same time that you are speaking. I'm so sorry for asking. Yes, yes, that's good. But then I worked, I ran away from home at the age of 20. I got a scholarship from Aga Khan Foundation that is based in Paris and Portugal now. So I became a development practitioner with them. And then I carried that Eurocentric modernity to villages that you look, you have to study this, you have to learn language, English language, you have to make yourself economically productive, you have to be, you know, Look, there, there is a model coming from London and France. That's what, where we need to go. We need to catch up with them. So that's what I became, a very romantic development practitioner. All this was happening in my life, thinking I am fighting for freedom for myself and everybody else, a savior. And then my own village, my own town is located in indigenous look, uh, population. So I grew up with Adivasis around me, the indigenous population around me. But you know what? I thought they needed development and I was superior. I was racist. Because it internalized that I was superior than them and they need to progress. So, uh, and in our constitution also, they are, they are worded as backward primitive and education system calls them monkeys. And I internalized that, right? And then what else is happening in my area? My area comes in the red belt, which is left-wing hard extremist red belt. What's happening? Adivasis are being forcibly displaced for modernization and development projects. Their lands are taken away for industries and mining. The mining investor comes from mainly urban dominant caste location. Some mining investors are based also in the UK. And they, India's millions of Adivasis have been forcibly displaced. They experience cultural genocide through education. The suffering from deforestation, climate injustices, and I did not see that. I did not see their struggle. I just saw my victimhood, right, and my hard work. And but I did not see my privileges, which were unearned. So we cannot simply have a Eurocentric understanding of coloniality. Hmm? So that's what I want to make a first uh, important point for me that we cannot just have Eurocentric understanding of coloniality. There are other regional hegemonies also there. Also the idea of nation state or independence. When we say India's independence, whose independence? It's the dominant caste independence. It's not Adivasi independence. So when we say statement like India received independence, we need to question who is writing this statement? Who received independence? When we say nation state, who benefits from nation state and who is continuously violated for the survival of the nation state? For, for Adivasi struggle, it's not nation state, it's open prison. You react, you challenge the state policy on development, you get in a center development hold into the closed prison. So your, your move from open prison to closed prison is just like that. Yeah. So just like in the USA jails, a substantial for proportion of the jailed people come from the black and indigenous people. In India, they come from Dalit, Adivasi, and Muslim background. And who are India's Muslims? They come from all these caste oppressed backgrounds. So it's all caste there. Anyway, so we need to question these old categories, but we'll come to that later. Then I come to London. You see my dream? Being civilized, being free. I remember when, when I was a student, I read the. A, a book by Stuart Hall, and he says, as they hailed down the flag, uh, we got all, we got into a banana boat and we moved to London, the center of the world. Yes, and you know what? It I me. Saw the stream. I thought the streets were play paved with gold. I thought everybody was edu very well educated. I thought everybody was rich. It was a land of freedom and opportunity for everybody. Oh my God, <laughs> right? So I came 
that's why I came, you know? And because I came because many people tell me, go back to your slum. And I say, look, <laughs> you were there. Just give me all my money back. 45 trillion to be exact. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, so I experienced racism. And this is the first time in my life I recognize what racism is. What I gave to Adivasi people, I was being given. So now I realize because, uh, you know, sometimes we don't realize what discrimination is unless our privileges are challenged. That's what happened to me. Yeah. So I realized in IOE's documents and many conversations in the field of development, ah, we're savages. We, and then there is a history of IOE itself. It was colonial department. Today, my job title is lecturer in education and international development. But then in 1930s, colonial department where empire took the mantle of educating the natives, barbaric natives, they saw us savages. So my grandmother was a savage from that point of view. Then my mother's generation, because I was looking at archives over the years. So my mother's generation was semi-savage in that document. And in my generation, my white academics are telling each other, each other, not to me, telling each other, oh, we need to go beyond deficit discourses. So, wow, wow. So now, thank you. You want to go beyond calling me savage and semi-savage, semi-savage. Anyway, so that's when I realized, so this is where I come from. I come from a rural area in India where I have my own set of internalized sexism and casteism and racism of our own form. But then I am the victim of the same issues. And that's when my positionality is, if that makes sense. So at once, you know, tomorrow Stephen will talk about abyssal line. So I'm going to leave him to unpack that. But it's, it's, a, it's an invisible line of thinking, way of thinking where humanity and worldview and subjectivity of this side are valued and that side are erased and violated. Hmm? That's my simplistic explanation. And I came from both, right? So I'm coming from the abyssal line where I am the one erased, but then I'm also on this side of the line where I was part of the erasure, if that makes sense. So anyway, so that's where I stand. And my tube light is they say, you know, in India, we say tube light, khul uh, the tube light opened. For me, I changed when. So as I said, I had this savior position already that, you know, people need to catch up in my villages. And my Dalit colleagues told me, I was at Ivy by then, we don't need saviors. Because at the moment we have right-wing government and there is a lot of issues with the new citizenship laws. So I got more actively engaged in India. And they said, we don't need saviors. We are doing that job for ourselves, educating ourselves. We also don't need you to do critical consciousness of the oppressed. So you keep that to you. We're doing educate, critical educative work for ourselves. What we need you to do Go back to your own privileged circles, educate them in what are, how are their privileges sustained through their ignorance and complicity and silences that is ensuring our continuous displacement. So your role is not to come and make me data or a object of your randomized trial, randomized control trials, go back to privileged group, reverse the case, and unpack their issues, their complicity, and their gaze, and problems with their silences that's keeping us marginalized and violated. That's where I shifted, yeah? And that was my biggest unlearning. And the, as I said, and then by the time my uh, uh, critical consciousness opened a bit more, uh, the roads must fall in 2016 had started. Now, Rhodes must fall in South Africa, as many of us know. Rhodes, Rhodes was prime minister of Cape Colony. He was mining magnet. Empire was huge land grab project. He donated some of the land to establish this uh, University of Cape Town, mainly for, for, for white students. Anyway, black students said that 
roads must fall because it stood in the middle of the campus as a reminder how great philanthropist he was. But they said, no, this is whitewashing. He was a land grabber. He was an ardent imperialist. He was racist. He represents a system which must fall, yeah? And, and then this movement came to Oxford because Oxford has Rhodes Scholarship. Uh, it went to UCL, it went to Bristol. It, you know, it started spreading in different parts of the Western campuses. Uh, King Leopard must fall, Queen Mary University in London, and then Galton must fall. Our UCL, where I am located, had actually eugenic science. So there was an entire research center endowed uh, for Francis Galton, who was cousin of Charles Darwin, to do race science, that how white men are superior and how human beings are stacked in a hierarchy, right? So hierarchy of human. And they believe that that was actually science, a scientific uh, way of thinking. So UCL also had, why is my curriculum white? And we need to <laughs> question these legacies and by the time I'm just exploring my journey at the moment, huh? and through that, I'm just trying to explore broader, broader context, really. But it's just storytelling is a way of doing that. So then George Floyd happened. And that deeply shook me up. Somebody suffers for eight and a half minutes. Nobody steps in. And where was I all these years unseeing? You see, it's not, it's not happening, we unsee it. And then I started Decolonial Cafe Diary. Then I basically, that's when I, I became someone from a savior. I unlearned being a romantic Western-centric naive development savior to learning to show up differently learning to show up differently in global ethical solidarity with the most violated in their own terms. So this is a decolonial statement for me. Hmm? So this is how I understand decolonization. It's learning to show up differently from the saviorism in global ethical solidarity with some of the most marginalized and violated populations in their own terms, not in our own terms. Okay, is that okay so far? Thank you. Now we'll have more interactive bit. Oscar is happy. Okay, so why don't you read these 13 statements hmm? and make a tally of how many yeses you have, huh? If it applies to you, you have a yes, just give yourself one point. So maximum, you should have 13 points. Minimum, you should have zero. Everybody, yeah, including me. I'm very afraid of Oscar. He's going to throw me any time out of this place, so... Yeah. yeah, just consider that you're in current stage of life and consider the city where you will live as of March, March and April, because this is when time and space uh, bound, right? Things can change when you're in different location and it changes when you're in different stage of life. So this is very time, space bound. Just mm -hmm. think of the present.
Done? Ready? I'm not yet. Okay. Another one minute. If that makes anybody happy, I'll get only one here. Which one? I get this. I can go to toilet with these. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, ready? Okay. Those who have all 13 out of 13, I just want to assure you, these are structural issues. So if you have 13, we're not inviting you to feel guilty. <laughs> Uh, all we are saying is how we accumulate different kinds of unearned advantages. And those privileges, we need to do something with it because that's where call to solidarity is even stronger for us now because we can do something with those privileges. So don't feel guilty. This is a call to do something in solidarity. Okay, all 13. Can you raise your hand, those who are all 13? Right. Do you mind me standing here? In the top of human high you have all 13? Yeah. Are you <laughs> sure? yeah. Everybody who has who has 30, please go there. Anybody got zero? Anybody on zero? Do you please, what's your name? Timothy, could you please stand at the back? Real at the back. Are you sure you have 13? Maybe he considered his own context. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. Because it also changes. Yeah. Those who are who have got seven to twelve, please can you stand there? And those who got less than seven, can you please stand just before Timothy? If you don't mind, can we please take a photo of oh, hierarchy with this class? Okay. Let's That's the Sorry. You know, what do we notice here now? Just just look around. This reflection. Oscar wants a reflection. Depending on your passport, you have different privileges. I feel like that. What is your passport? Russia. Yes. That's one of my reflections. That's one of yeah. I'm sure people will In terms of what else do you notice? At least in glowing. Okay. At least in glowing, the passport doesn't matter. Yeah. 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 We have a big variety of students. So for, for selection, we consider quite a lot. I mean, no. ah, yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, that's right. But yeah, that's that's right. 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 with a visa is not the same. I know, I'm not talking about this. I'm not yeah. talking about Sorry. this. I'm talking about. Everyone has the right to apply for a scholarship, no matter yeah. the passport. Yes. Yeah, that's true. yeah, whether we need to to deal with other challenges once we are there, that's completely true. Yes. But uh, 
Yes. We're not talking about Globet's recruitment system right now. Huh? <laughs> We're talking about the field of knowledge, international development. And within this field, what are the hierarchies that it generates? It, it has. Yes? I think everyone up to here are from Europe. Are from Europe. Yeah, from Europe. Yeah. 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 That's a very good observation that in this hierarchy, a lot of people, sub, 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 uh, significant proportion actually comes from Europe, and actually everybody is from Europe. Yeah. Not Scotland anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> people come from very diverse backgrounds, as you can see, mm -hmm. right? So there is more diversity in the lower lower end of knowledge production, but there is less diversity mm -hmm. in the up top end of knowledge production in English language as well. Mm -hmm. right? So I, because this uh, workshop is about knowledge production, right? So I just want us to be critical about that this is not a neutral field. But, but Laya, sorry to interrupt. You, you, are, you are reproducing the hierarchy now. I am by unpacking causing, the By hierarchy. causing emotions to people, no? In, in fact, I am showing it, making it visible. Yeah. Because these hierarchies exist, but they've been invisibilized. And I think it's a chance to confront them. And by doing so, then we hope to not reproduce. Them. Exactly. That's by facing it. This is what Andriotti says, facing human wrongs. But if we don't face it, we gloss over it, we will not confront it and dismantle it. So this is facing human wrong. So who do we see right at the top and who do we see right at the end? Color matters. That Color matters. matters. So we have a white man on the top and a black man at the end. Right? And this is not the first time it's happening. I've run this exercise at least 10 times in 10 different locations. And every time, invariably, the top is a white middle class man and the bottom is a black woman or a black man or black them. That has never changed. That has just consistently stayed. And you know what? The white European population, not European, but white population consists of just 16.6% of the world. So who is dominating our knowledge? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so, I I I don't know. Now, because I think that we have now the matches. Okay, I'm gonna quickly move on because I'm very aware of Oscar's presence here. Now, love you. So, global climate injustice matters. The darker skinned people in the global majority more, whether they are in the USA or Australia, or Africa. These are, these are racialized injustices, and yet, who represents the most, right? So it, uh, these are these hierarchies that feeds into broader structure. So what we saw, as they say in critical feminist literature, personal is political. What happens in one single micro setting is broad. Yeah, so what we try to show that this is a broad, there are broader histories that have shaped our positionality in this hierarchy, right? So we haven't created them, but we benefit from them. We haven't created them, but some of us don't benefit from them. That's the point. And yet, I mean, UCL, I have to call this out. <laughs> Even at UCL, we announced our delegation in, in you know, climate uh, and these were all white middle-class people and then they projected themselves with all these orientalist images that they are the one talking about climate change. They don't even frame it as climate injustice. Uh, uh, so we had to call it out. 
in, in my own uh, where I am, you see cisgendered middle class heterosexual white women leading gender discourses and what's happening to the black women. So these group will talk about exclusion of black women, but they're not hired. And I've been on hiring panels and I'll tell you how that happens right in front of my eyes. This happened only just 15 days ago. A man with Cambridge degree, Preston degree got hired as the more suitable person than a black feminist whose work is on extremely significant issue, school to prison pipeline for black people in the UK. And for sociology post, that person got hired and not this feminist and both had just equal uh, publications, but she went to a, uh, she did not go to Cambridge and she was not man and she was not white. And, and in our UCL data, about 7,000 professors, how many are white men? A significant portion. Look at the UK data. 110 black professors in UKHI out of 18,425 professors, 0.6%. That's not reflective of the population. Only 25 are black in Brazil. So you see, so these hierarchies are what is happening more broadly. So, so what does it mean for knowledge production is the question I ask. So what's your response? You know, Katya told me yesterday, myth of meritocracy. Katya, you're writing about that, right? Um, yeah, I'm, so for my thesis, I'm doing research on um, the, there's 13 scholarship foundations in Germany who mm -hmm. are partially, or they're partially funded by the German government um, and studies, or one study that was conducted more than 10 years ago showed that um, over 50% of those that get a scholarship through these foundations are from academic backgrounds. Um, and as you say, also not very reflective of the entire student body. So they've tried to rework their policy with the aim of, um, yeah, trying to have a more reflective um, like group of scholarship holders, but there hasn't been a study conducted on it since. So I have a suspicion that um, there, there isn't, or there hasn't been much change. Um, yeah, and I think as you say, um, in terms of then how this defines who deserves scholarships is, not being questioned and these structures aren't being um, challenged um, because it's just reproducing what uh, already exists. So yeah. Thanks Katya. Yeah. So whose knowledge is valued? Whose lives matter? Whose knowledge is silenced? Um, so let's come to the quiz now. <laughs> so you done that, right? Now let's look at the answers. Uh, sorry that I didn't uh, manage to set this up before because there was so much going on here. Let's see if we can. Log in now, so, and see the responses. And I know questions themselves are deeply problematic, so. Oh, yes, we managed to log in. So now let's see what the responses are. So 24, okay. 89% said that map looks normal. 11%. Why did you do that? Those who said 89% uh, majority? That's what we see in the classrooms. That's what, that's what they're taught. Okay. And but 11% says that the below looks normal. I'm very curious. So if you could tell us a bit more. 
Yeah, I think like um, I had a background where this was taught. Like, so we have the, um, I, don't, I don't know if I was going to ask you this, sorry. <laughs> like, <laughs> there is this one map of like Latin America upside down that it's been quite like now at the university, it's more popular. Yeah. Uh, so like, this is presented and then that is presented and but it's like because we have the courses on like the colonialism you know, yeah that's all so that's <laughs> so you'd already deconstructed it well, right. I'm trying to. so now is it just a coincidence that europe is in the center is it just a coincidence that it's on the top is it just a coincidence that it's larger than the actual size of africa I think there was also maps circulating for a while in social media showing the proportions were also off, like that Europe was always depicted as much larger than it is exactly. in reality. So yeah. that is so also is it a coincidence. It's not. And this is actually Peter Galma. That's a marketer map, but this is Peter Galma. And the marketer, whoever designed that map, the guy marketer called. <laughs> Uh, he was actually concerned with the size of the ocean for navigation purposes. He wasn't very concerned about the proportion. Yet, why is Europe on this in the center and on top? You know? So those questions still don't resolve. This is Peter Galma that shows actual uh, geographical proportion. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's come to Christopher Columbus discovered the Americas. You're such a brilliant badge. Because I run this exercise in my class in IOE, where students are about, from about 46 countries, and they tell me, about 80 to 85% tell me the first one is right. These students come from Japan, Zanzibar, India, Pakistan. And you know what they tell me? They read this in their textbook. How many of you read this in your textbook? So actually a major proportion. And where do you come from? I'm from Myanmar. And you read it in your textbook? Yeah. Yeah. Textbook? Who else? <laughs> yes. So look at the number of people from different countries, right? Cambodia, read it in textbook. I read it in India in textbook, like Kavya. So imagine, so who is, so, so, so you have clearly disrupted this, but the decolonial, post-colonial pattern is now, who is writing history? You tell me, who is writing this history? Who, are, who is the audience of this history telling? Do you think indigenous? This is true. <laughs> do you think the indigenous native, native population wrote this history? No. No. So you tell me then, who wrote it? I'm not asking name. But the positionality, it's Eurocentric history. It's white men writing this history for other white men that look, Columbus discovered Americas, it's their right over that. Vasco da Gama discovered the Goa, it's Portuguese right. You know, this is territorial divisions. So there is knowledge and power and greed. It's all going together. Right? Yeah. It's like they want to neutralize the language so that, so that it doesn't sound as bad as it is. Exactly. Now, <laughs> now I don't need to labor this point, but the point, post-colonial point is, we need to question who is the storyteller? Helen told one story. In the afternoon we go, we heard another story. Maybe left Teresa's third story. Maybe somebody will have another story. So the question is, what are the perspectives through which knowledge is produced? We're not saying denounce all these stories, but we are saying we need to question the stories. Also, we need to question who is silent in this story? Yeah, who were in the panel yesterday telling us? Who was missing in that panel? Post-colonial knowledge production is questioning this. In an entire day, which perspectives dominated and which perspectives were not there in the room, which voices were not there. I'm not saying the, I'm not questioning validity or not, but that's not the point I'm making. I'm saying we are researchers. Our job is to question, yeah? Our job is to question then which narratives become dominant and hegemonic and why? 
So this, this narrative is global. But it's a provincial narrative, it's an imperial narrative, but it became global. So how many such things have become global and we don't even know? Right? France gave the world. Okay, so this is deconstructed. So we are not labor the point here. Science, again, this is deconstructed. So I wouldn't labor the point here. Which sentence? So again, Britain helped develop, you know, did we give you bridges and railways? My own family, I'm married to an Englishman, right? So my own family tell me my in-laws we gave you railways. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> How many do you kill? <laughs> and you know what? Utsa Patnaik is fantastic economist. She has actually looked at the East India Company so 400 years, and she's actually crunched the data and claims that 45 trillion amount of money, I mean, wealth was stolen from south asia and that funded plus the resources <laughs> extracted plus labor forced which was unpaid all that contributed to the western industrialization all that fed into the uk's development so sorry uk india developed you okay so <laughs> Which sentence sounds familiar? Now, I just added this last night. So my sentence is a bit clumsy because the West itself, we need to de deconstruct everything. I'm not saying we need to justify. All this needs deconstruction. But the sentence we normally hear is that, you know, civilizations of Greece and Rome, but how about the West has roots in black civilizations in Africa? We don't hear that. You see, racism is so deep. Now let's come to, come to, come to the, Come to the map, right? So, how do I do slideshow from current slide? <clears throat> this site has been huge area of knowledge exchange and knowledge protection. So, nation state as a modern colonial idea. Hmm? People did not see their identities in nations as nations before colonization. Yeah. And they did not see themselves as nation state. This is a modern idea. And we'll come to modernity, coloniality a little bit later on, if Oscar allows me. But, uh, but these were sites of extreme knowledge exchange, music exchange, the language exchange and all that. And you know what? We have an 18th century French thinker present in this room. May I invite Volney? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. The ancient Egyptians were true Negros of the same type as all native born Africans. That being so, we can see how their blood mixed for several centuries with, the, with that of the Greeks and Romans must have lost the intensity of its original color while retaining nonetheless the imprint of its original mouth. Just think that this race of black men, today our slave and the object of our scorn, is the very race to which we owe our arts, science, and even the use of speech. Just imagine, finally, that it is in the midst of people who call themselves the greatest friends of liberty and humanity that one has approved the most barbarous slavery and question it whether black men have the same kind of intelligence as whites. Thank you, Olani. <laughs> that was an 18th century. It's not that, you know, sometimes we, I meet people and they say, they were people of their time. They believed that way. No, there were people in the, of the time who thought like Olani did, that we need to actually acknowledge our debt. I mean, if all everybody has come from Af Africa, we are all migrants from Africa, right? So this categorization, Western civilization coming from Greece, whose categorization is this? It could have easily been because of a different political co-contingency. Co it could have been Western Asian civilization. It could have been Black civilization. These are contingencies. 
but then the, the contingencies go with politics and politics of knowledge production. So, so these categories. So what do post-colonial thinkers do? These are just sample. Post-colonial thinkers, what do they do? They unwell how the world has re received a powerful view of the world. This quiz is just an example, right? That powerful view of the world uh, has been delivered by a Eurocentric viewpoint. And when we see Eurocentric viewpoint, it's a particular hearts of the empire. Germany, Britain, Italy, Spain, <laughs> right? USA. <laughs> So th there are particular locations. Uh, not everybody in Europe has equal equality, if I'm making clumsy sentence there. Uh, and what post-colonial thinkers do, they expose how the histories of colonialism has influenced Western thought and logic of authority. So, and how non-Western populations are either spoken of, as you noted, you know, my dear, that how, a majority here, produce, knowledge producer in the baking order was from Europe, right? Producing knowledge about them, excluded ones like the rest of the world, producing knowledge about the rest of the world, speaking for, depicting them uh, through their own Western self-image. So what post-colonial thinkers do is try to establish genealogies of knowledge and other processes of knowing that do not reinforce the dominance of the West. So what through quiz we try to do is try to bring in other way of knowing, hmm? other histories that were rendered, that are rendered non-mainstream. Anyway, so that's post-colonial exercise. And we have a very uh, famous uh, post-colonial thinker who, is credited as the founder of post-colonial field, Edward Said. He was a Christian. Uh, he was born in a Christian family, uh, born in Palestine, exiled because of the 1948 uh, invasion of the Palestinian lands. Uh, for, uh, we need to recognize all kind of suffering. And, his family was exiled to Egypt. He ended up in University of Columbia. He does come from an elite background uh, still, uh, but he says that how the discourses in the heart of the empire through literature, through film, through institutional norms, produce the idea of the Orient and Occident, the East and the West, but then the East gets exoticized and the West becomes the norm, barbaric, and civilized, irrational other, and rational, exotic and the norm. So these are the binaries that get created. Now this has influenced the world. Right from the quiz, I said that there's so many ways that exist in the world, but the coloniality has meant that that particular view of the world has become way of thinking about our identities and the world. We'll explain that a bit more a little bit later, but what Andriotti's challenge to us is facing human wrongs. Hmm? Facing and and we need to uh, raising and we need to actually now really think beyond this modernity paradigm, which has become hegemonic. And that's where we will come to the next decolonial challenge. But I'm going to start with a puzzle. Trigger warning, I should have given you. But let's face the human wrong. Right? This situation hasn't arri arisen is in vacuum. right? Now I'm going to ask you a puzzle. This is not my puzzle. This is Andriotti's puzzle. And let's see what you answer. And then I'll invite the, our theater performers. For example, you see many young children drowning in a body of water. Yeah? What will you do? Your first impulse would probably be to try to save them. Yeah? If you're not ultra xenophobic, then you probably, your first impulse will be just try to save them or search for help. But what? If you looked up, and saw many boats. Now, this is where I'm asking you the question. But what if you looked up and see many, many boats are throwing the children in the water and these boats are multiplying by the minute? 
how many different tasks would be necessary to stop the boats and prevent this from happening again? Question is to you. What will you do basically to prevent this? Um, just handle the one who gives the orders. To throw Sorry? People. Handle the one who gives the orders to throw people off the boat. Okay, so handle the one that is actually giving that order to throw children off in the, the water. Yes, what else will you do? Yes, Lafkaris? Inequalities that produce the flows. Okay, so stopping the inequalities that are actually generating these flows. That's very interesting. So you'll go to the root cause of problems in some sense. What else would you? Yeah, please, come on. It's... No, I was just thinking, I didn't base it on that, but also going to the leadership uh, behind those decisions yes. on the platforms. Yes, so what are the actors responsible? for making this condition to take place, something like that? Yeah. And hold them accountable? Yes? Um, this is a completely different way, uh, and it also feels wrong as I'm saying it. Yeah. But uh, I feel like all the children should be learned how to, um, to be taught how to swim and get to a shore and just <laughs> use nobody. Children should be given skills to swim? Yeah, productive skills, so that they should be able to know better. No, so yeah. Not only question the ones that are giving the order, but the ones that are performing it, the ones that are thrown to. Yeah, yeah. also holding those accountable who are throwing children. Oscar, and, uh, what will you do? I don't know when they are throwing the children out of You will find out why it's happening? Yeah. Yeah, why it's happening? Yes. Realistically speaking, if I saw many, realistically speaking, if I saw many boats and kids were thrown out, I would just be frantic. I don't think I'd be able to do anything. You will feel helpless. Yeah? yeah. This is all legitimate responses. Everything you said, these are all legitimate responses. People do respond this way, you know. Now, what Andriotti says, I suggest there are at least four tasks: hmm? rescuing the children in the water. Yeah rescuing the children, stopping the boats from throwing the children in the water. So some of you said stopping, you know, the boats from throwing the children in the water. Going up to see why is this happening in the first place? Yeah, as you said, why is this happening in the first place? Also collecting the bodies of the dead by remembering them and raising awareness of what's ha happened and what's happening, so raising awareness. The role of education comes in here. Uh, but what if you realize, now this is very interesting. What if you realize that you are actually in one of those boats? You're not bystander, you're actually in one of those boats. It's a child. <laughs> yeah. It could be a child, but what, let's see. Uh, what is one of the actors? or one of the silent ones who is not actually throwing, but just watching other people throw and doing nothing about it. What if you're on the boats? And what, you're actually in one of the boats throwing children with one hand and trying to rescue them with the other. <laughs> yeah? What if you're actually throwing them on hand and then rescuing them on the other? Therefore, I suggest that education should help people in the task of learning to go up the river to seek the roots of the problem so that the emergency strategies down the river, down this body of river water can be better informed. Understanding why this is happening and tackling it so that we have better strategies for the rescue in the hope that one day no more boats will throw children in the water and no more of this will happen. Now, going up further than just rescuing the children means asking questions such as what creates poverty? What Lefteris was saying, right? What creates poverty? How come different lives have different values? How are these two things connected? Creation of poverty and different values people hold. Uh, what are the relationship between social groups that are overexploited and social groups that are overexploiting? How are these relationships maintained? 
how do people come to think and relate like this? So now I invite a theater performance by your facilitator and try and find some answers to these questions. Okay, so we have, I'm gonna introduce the characters as they come. So we have a big short universal bank. Stack. Oh. <laughs> That's why it's stuck. My phone is in there. <laughs> so I'm coming. The Universal Bank would never up with this. Actually, I got you a very big chair there. <laughs> That's really yeah. Then we have a UK academic consultant that the great Universal Bank works with. I like to turn your throat. It's a part of that. We have UK academic consultant that works with the Universal Bank, gets lots of funding from them. Yeah. Hi, bank. <laughs> then we have a Education Foundation company. So public private partnership. So this is a foundation company. And we have head of the development from the UK representing the government. So we need one more chair. So, ah, there you are. You know what? You're very superior. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah okay. Okay, now. Sorry, I bring a chair. That chair's outside. But he doesn't have enough chairs. No, no. <laughs> okay, so just to explain the context, the Great Bank has organized this meeting. And the sentences, now I just want to give a disclaimer that the field of education and international development is very, there are many actors who come from very different subjectivities. huh? Uh, so I'm not homogenizing them. I'm just trying to present one particular mainstream paradigm through this. Huh? Uh, but actors come from many different subjective motivations. So I just want us to keep in mind. And Riote looks at certain common problems in our mainstream education strategies and development strategies. So Riote calls them in the head subject list. It will show up behind you soon. Uh, so, and these characters are composite characters. They, they are composite characters. I've merged many characters into these characters. And the most of all, every single sentence that's there in their script is a real sentence spoken by real people. Theater of the Privileged that we have founded works with real sentences and deconstruct them. Huh? So these are real sentences spoken by real people. Now, your job, all of you also have a role to play. Your role is deconstruct this theater of the privileged using heads up checklist. I'm not sure if you can see this, but uh, what is the best way? As I said, this architecture makes a lot of assumptions. Yeah. Um, you can come down. Yes, that would be great. Thank you, Helen. <laughs> now, can I suggest no, we we'll read this <laughs> and pack this from using the first words of hegemony? Hmm? This four people, you will have ethnocentrism. Your, you four people will have a historicism. This is your lens to be constructed theater. Then in this middle, let's have these five people. Salvationism, that side, maybe can we have you on that side? You will look at uncomplicated solution and people at the back, you will look at paternalism. Paternalism. Uh, huh? Paternalism. So just listen to this theater and apply your lens, your concept to unpack this. Okay, there you go. On behalf of the Great Universe Bank, 
We have organized this meeting to discuss the education of climate refugee and displaced children in the developing and underdeveloped countries. We are here to deliberate on a business case. We really do think it's important to focus on the positive aspects of this crisis. There are now so many students in one place desperate for education. It is a good opportunity to build up human capital out of these underdeveloped and dependent communities. That's right, dear. They really do not have the capacity to provide education. <laughs> <laughs> On top of that, that they have inefficiency, corruption, lack of accountability, resource crunch, population growth, running out of fingers here, <laughs> not surprising really, uh, that we are required. We have the technical expertise to roll out education programs in several regions. We can help them. They are technically backwards by Western standards. So this is UK development representative. That's a private company based in the USA. That's great bank. And <laughs> ran out of the floor. So <laughs> the UK academic consultant. So two US based, two UK based, huh? Just to clarify. We are already working on Africa. We are ensuring that we are ensuring that Africa does not succumb to another dark age of dependency on others. The same with Afghanistan. The last month we started working on Afghan. Afghan woman. We have our UK collaborators on board. We can't just tweak the program as likely for other regions. We provide everything, literacy, numeracy, technology, gender, human rights, mensuration, health. We are adapting Western education to the needs of other countries. We have a very nice common strategy to diagnose and cure educational problem anywhere. That's very nice. The UK is also guiding and helping these people to stand on their own feet. We're also teaching them our, uh, our English, our manners, our civilization. They have so much to catch up with. Great. Yeah. So we yeah. must make the benefits of our scientific advances and industrial progress available for the improvement and growth of these underdeveloped peoples. How about we call out our new initiative, Climate Resilience Education. A portion of academic talent should be devoted to generating those new concepts. It will underpin US foreign policy in the generation ahead. We must deter the spread of Moscow's influence through our development strategy. Also, their poverty is a handicap and a treat both to them and to more prosperous areas like ours. Yeah. Sounds good. But recently, our decolonial colleagues have written a very negative literature review. Yeah. They yeah. were saying that our Europe I that developed that. Africa. <laughs> and we should frame the issue as an issue of global political accountability. Hold the polluter elites accountable and make preparation. Oh, yes, I, I, I read the review too. Very ideological. <laughs> <laughs> the colonizer took, but I want to say with some respect that we also gave. Oh. Uh, the bridges. He built bridges, roads, hospitals. You saw that nice hotel that we built here in the bathroom, right? <laughs> <laughs> he gave his effort, his work, know how. We need not feel too badly about our record at any rate. In fact, em the empire was for the good of the world. We had constructive attitude, authority, and purposefulness of direction. Our approach reflects mature humanity. Interesting perspective. <laughs> All this talk of climate justice and reparation, mm, the USA Department of State is very clear. The US has about 50% of the world's wealth but only 6.3% of the population. In this situation, we cannot fail to be the object of envy and resentment. Our real task is to devise a pattern of relationships which will permit us to maintain this position of disparity. <laughs> so what should be our business case? Business case? 
resilience education is a better focus. Climate refugees. Hmm? I'm just saying real sentences. <laughs> uh, climate refugees must be resilient. Yes, that will speak to our lenders and investors. Can you issue some funding for researchers to study how people in the global south are coping with climate change? <laughs> yes. Well, it is good for our security interests to know how people are coping. So I assume some of it will be a conditional loan to the governments of those regions and that we will be a technical partner? Yes, but we won't call it a loan. It would be part of our aid. Ah. Our research show that refugees, and I'm happy that their voice is being undermined in policy making. Ah, they need to be open minded and tolerant. In fact, they should be grateful. They lack resources, capacity, knowledge. We have the power to apply the wisdom that we think we have gained from our experience. Did anyone kill these bastards after this? <laughs> In fact, we do have some representation from refugee academics in some of our projects. They don't even have to do much except collect data and assist. Our Western experts located in London, Geneva, and Washington, mostly white middle-class men, do all the hard work, thinking and theorizing and make all the important decisions. Of course, it is fair that we pay our 28-year-old Western expert who have never been to Global South to work on the Global South at least five to 10 times more than a refugee woman academic with 30 years experience in the Global South. It's only fair. And we do work on refugees. Look at the way we've welcomed our Ukrainian. Oh, it's refugees. recent. It's, it's, it's recent. <laughs> yeah. It is sad that we saw that ship sink off the Italian coast. That's why we've created the plan to send black and brown refugees to Rwanda. But these people, Ukrainians, are Europeans. These people are intelligent. They're educated people. These are not the refugee people who could have being even terrorists. These aren't like the other children that we've been accustomed to see suffer on TV. These children are blonde with blue eyes. So this is very important. We need the pictures of these guys. Yeah. The UK and user we have prospered because of our hard work, our democracy, our way of life, our knowledge. People are politically and economically what they are because of their deep cultural and spiritual nature. They have to break the shackles of superstitions. The tragedy of Africa is that the African has not fully entered into history. I know that political leaders of these nations are also particularly prone to the dangers of general distrust. If they fail in open mindedness, then the communities they pretend to serve will rapidly find themselves on the slope which leads to Aboriginal savagery and fratricide instead of climbing to the summit of civilized living in mutual confidence. I'm thinking we could organize a Christmas charity even to support those who are suffering refugees from the global south. We can get some celebrity singers. How does that sound? Oh, yes. So why don't we get refugee children to say a few words about how grateful they are? <laughs> they should be able to say a few sentences in English, you think? Mm -hmm. right. And maybe we can get in the press in too. That would be such nice publicity for our work. Good job. Wow. wow. Okay. We want names and photos and addresses. Mm -hmm. okay. no, thank you. Are, so many. Archive. Are they just news? Some of them are from Central mm -hmm. ah. <laughs> And Ukrainian, post Ukrainian openness. I have another presentation on that. Oh. That's great. Thank you so much for what you did. That's amazing. Now, we I tried to introduce you to a particular problematic paradigm here. Hmm? 
uh, that's identified as white savior paradigm, but we can also have brown saviors, as I said, in the case of India and other regionally hegemonic uh, saviorism. So uh, I'm just saying we need to be mindful of uh, that. It's not that the West is dominating and the world is flat. <laughs> the world also has hierarchies. <laughs> yeah. So, but this is a paradigm that dominates thinking. The mainstream education and international development thinking. Hmm? So what, what are some of the common problems in this paradigm? So if you can now reflect back quickly on, this is Andrew Ortiz's head subject list to analyze our field. Yes? The idea of underdeveloped and developing nation, then what development looks like. So, you know, there's only one version of development, which is what the West considers developed. Yeah. And, you know, like the global South can't be trusted to come up with their own solutions or manage their own you know, development, like they're inefficient, they're corrupt, that whole narrative. So we need to decide, the West needs to decide yeah. how to spend money, where to spend money, what counts as expertise and knowledge. Yeah. And, development and, and don't worry, we, we co-opt you as advanced native <laughs> who studied in our yeah. places. Yeah. So thank you, yeah. I was reflecting uh, using the Sovationism um, concept and basically uh, what we saw, especially uh, from the UK and the USA, is how they feel uh, very comfortable um, working on, with this concept of solidarity and benevolence uh, instead of social justice. So it's, it's really okay for them just to feel like, oh, <laughs> we're saving the refugees, we're already doing a lot. So uh, this is good because we are good, you know, like we are helping them. And uh, especially with the, what they suggest, like, oh, we're even fake, uh, posting pictures of the children, you know? So this is basically Sebastianism, like how they feel uh, in, empowered to really think that they are the saviors and they don't uh, reflect on the fact that they are actually the cause. Of them. So they're not even doing what they should do uh, to, um, to have any type of social justice, right? So this is really common for Europe and the uh, North America to just uh, really stand for advocate for uh, social uh, and nonprofit organizations, volunteer work, but never, never really uh, talking about social justice in the sense that we don't need um, benevolence, we don't need solidarity. Actually, we need laws and uh, like uh, uh, to ensure rights. You know. Yeah. So this is what I had. Uh, Great, definitely. Thank you so much. And I can see many hands. So Oscar has given a dedicated reflection time. And I would really love all these reflections to be shared then. Huh? So now I'm going to quickly wrap up. But you got the point that we have analytical tools coming from decolonial movement that we can use to unpack wherever this paradigm show. Huh? But we also have a lot of critical scholars. And many of them are sat here in this room, including yourself, right? So, uh, so we have a solidarity as well. But so that's a paradigm that dominates, and that paradigm has roots in particular way of thinking. And this is where I'm going to very quickly ask you, what do you see? You know, and I have only five minutes, so I'm going to just say it myself now. What we see usually when I show this. It's a type of knowledge production. Your researchers, you'll be producing knowledge. We need to be aware of our own positionality. What kind of knowledge are we producing? This is also knowledge production. And this is produced by John uh, Gast. He's a white middle-class male, aristocratic male rather. He's producing this image. Yeah, he's showing that how the America, the, you know, they stand for education, freedom, liberty, and white people are just nicely, calmly going about, natives are running away. There is prosperity and enlightenment and train and they're giving train, you know, and school. This is barbarism, reflects all darkness. This is knowledge production, re replicative of what you saw in the theater, right? So this is a dominant, there is this, history of uh, how this paradigm became dominant huh? and and uh, and what do you not see what does he not show us he does not show us 
genocide, slavery, racism, forced sterilization, land confiscation. You see, so knowledge production can be deeply highlighting nice things. We did this, but not highlighting the connection between our privileges here and the great deal of violence there. Do you so, have a date for the painting? It's uh, 1872. Yeah. So you have uh, these terminologies. We don't have time, but you can go over them during reflection and use those terminologies also to, uh, to articulate your analysis with. Uh, so what decolonial scholars say, this is a picture of modernity, right? <laughs> Minola talks about modernity coloniality. This is a picture of modernity. It's talking about the shine side, but there is a dark side of the modernity. Dark side is continuous violence of indigenous populations in the world. And it, it is very much embedded in racism. So John Gust, who is producing this knowledge, that gaze, you know, just because you're a white person does not mean you have white gaze. You can be my skin color and have white gaze. And you can be Oscar and not have white gaze. Huh? So when I say white gaze, it's not a biological pigment-based argument. It's, an, it's a paradigm. I, As I said, I produced that paradigm when I was in development savior, right? And somebody here, when Tony was writing, he was writing actually from a non-white gaze. And I was the one producing non-white gaze. So I just want to show that white gaze is that paradigm that keeps white supremacist structure. And you don't have to be white. And you don't have to be male. You don't have to be, you know, you can be in rural India like me and reproduce that. I, I hope I'm making that clear. Huh? Yeah. So the hierarchy of superiority and inferiority. modernity. Coloniality is actually the other side of the modernity. Yeah, so a lot of our development proposals are embedded in modernity, but the other side is coloniality. And that's where decolonial challenge is. And this knowledge production is not is coming from the place of dominance, no, that godlike image. He's not in the picture, he's not situating himself. He's projecting as if he's projecting a rational fact. He's not in the picture. He's not situating himself like I did in the story. So there is this tendency and this knowledge is possible by centuries of conquest and domination. That kind of knowledge production is the result of the centuries of killing and violence, yeah, dominance. And there is also epistemic sexism and racism. Yeah, I like how gender is used in this agenda, like right? how saving how women are used, how gender is used. Uh, and what a decolonial scholar says that, that it, there is an epistemic racism because white people's knowledge is valued. Black people, as we saw in our own classroom today, how the structural disadvantage that black people suffer is just enormous. And their knowledge is not even valued and we are not even acknowledging our debt to Africa for who we are today. <laughs> Right, so, so there is a great deal of epistemic racism, but also sexism, because women are also violated. Yeah, there was a great deal of burning at stake of women, white women as well. White women with knowledge, indigenous knowledges, white women with independence, they were burned to cement patriarchal capitalist order in Europe. So there is, a, and also, uh, whose knowledge count even within Europe? I said equalities, inequalities within Europe. It's 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 not uh, it's not everybody. What uh, uh, Grassfigel says is the knowledge of five locations, men from five locations: Britain, Germany, France, USA, Italy, and many of the other uh, scholars still have to struggle to prove their credential via. UK universities via American universities. So it affect, that coloniality affects people in Europe as well. Uh, a civilizing mission, we already talked about that how white person goes and save, that continues. There is a positionality we need to question who is drawing this image. 
uh, and and this has actually since 1492 when uh, Spain is involved here. <laughs> so when the foundational moment of this modern colonial world system, according to Gross Fickle, is 1492, when King Ferdinand and Isabella established at the back of the strong genocide against the uh, Jewish and Muslim uh, populations in Spain. And that's the year when Christopher Columbus went to the Americas and founded white settler, uh, you know, started that uh, uh, dominance uh, through lots of violence. So this is a system which is capitalist, but it's also patriarchal. It's also Western centric. It's also Christian centric because there is hierarchy of religions here. And it's a modern colonial world system. And this is the system in which knowledge is produced in a particular way. It also generated our sense of space, our sense of time. Where does time start, right? Sense of beauty, the hierarchy of races, the nature. This is the time when nature came to be understood as something to be exploited, something to profit men. Uh, and the Adivasi, the Adivasi people in my area, they didn't see nature as something to be exploited. They saw nature to be worshipped, revered, lived in harmony with. So imagine if Adivasi worldview, who saw all these uh, nature as commons, and to be guardian was the hegemonic paradigm. But no, the Adivasi got considered backward, right? So there is also all this uh, construction of nation state itself. Our identities as nations also is colonial construct. And then that construct became because of the empire, like UK being the center of the empire, that knowledge got circulated evidence is in our class that how in our textbooks everywhere we read particular. And that's where this civilizing mission also was used to justify and that continues. So that continues through institutional infrastructure. This is where we are today. As a result of that kind of modernity, coloniality and the idea of development, this is where we are today. This is where we are today. And there is a need to unlearn. So the question decolonial challenge to us, how do we relate to the global majority? It's not enough to say, I am not racist, but are we actively anti-racist? No need of white saviors or different brown saviors or different types of saviors, but we need to ask certain questions. In global ethical solidarity with the most violated populations as of today in the world. And I'll stop here now. Hmm? Thank you. Thank you.